to present the Drake Award for Paul Horowitz. We are thrilled to welcome my, my friend and colleague, Bill Nye, CEO of the Planetary Society, known to many as the Science Guy. The Planetary Society is the leading nonprofit space advocacy organization where the world's citizens work to advance space science and exploration. Bill is a scientist, engineer, comedian, author, and inventor, and a man on a mission to help foster a scientifically literate society to help people everywhere understand and appreciate the science that makes our world work. Welcome, Bill Nye. Uh, thank you indeed. Thank you, Adam. Thank you everyone for having me. Uh, as you may know, I uh, got involved in this business when I was an undergraduate. I took one class from Carl Sagan for kicks. I'd completed my mechanical engineering requirements and it changed my life. A couple times I saw Frank Drake in the hallways of the Space Sciences Building at Cornell University and I, like everybody else, I said, that's Frank Drake, man, that's Frank Drake. <laughs> and I just, like Carl Sagan, um, like Frank Drake, and like, I guess, everyone on this call, we are involved in this business of search for extraterrestrial intelligence because, because there are two questions that get to everybody. First of all, where did we come from? Where did humankind come from, if I may, for crying out loud? Where did humans come from? And then the other deep, deep question that's within all of us is, are we alone in the universe? And everybody understand what's really at stake here. I mean, I guess the people who have tuned in this evening or this afternoon or this morning, depending where you are on the planet, understand what's at stake here. If we were to discover evidence of life on another world, it would change the course of human history. Everybody would feel differently about being a living thing in the cosmos. Now, it is reasonable, very reasonable, and what drives me and what makes me get up in the morning most every day is the chance that there's life to be found in our solar system. But perhaps far, far more likely is that we will find life in another solar system. And to that end, uh, the SETI Institute is dedicated uh, to making this discovery. And the thing that I find so compelling about it, if nothing else, is the optimism, is that no matter as messed up as things might be here, or seem to be rather, here on Earth, this intense optimism that the likelihood of something being alive out there is so compelling, is overwhelming. So naturally, this is what we want to do with our time. And for those of you who haven't looked at it in a while, Here's my copy of Cosmos written by Carl Sagan back in 1980. And there is the Drake equation presented in com with compelling graphics. Every time I open to page 300, I go, wow, man, that is some thinking. And so uh, later in the program, I believe we're going to have a little something, something from uh, Frank. Uh, he and I recorded an interview a week, a little over a week ago. But uh, along that line, uh, Carl Sagan, Bruce Murray, who was the head of the planet, head of the Czech Propulsion Lab uh, during the heyday of the Voyager missions and Viking 1 and 2 landing on Mars, and Bruce, uh, rather, and uh, Lou Friedman, who was an orbital mechanics guy at the Jet Propulsion Lab, the three of them decided that government support of space exploration was not that high, but public support of it was especially high. And so they recruited uh, uh, Steven Spielberg and a young Paul Horowitz to uh, get involved in the search for extraterrestrial uh, life. And indeed they did. And when you visit the Planetary Society headquarters, I hope you all do in Pasadena, California, uh, once the uh, pandemic has calmed down enough for us all to wander about maskless, I hope you'll come by and you can see a circuit board that Dr. Horowitz uh, designed, if I can use the expression, back in the day. And that circuit board was among the very first multi-channel circuit boards tuned for the search for extraterrestrial life. And then uh, we were at the Clay Center, the Clay Astronomy, uh, Clay Observatory rather, 
in Massachusetts when Paul set up this remarkable optical SETI search where we were able, where he and his colleagues were able to tune to this extraordinary accuracy in the cosmos. And this is the kind of thing that will have to be done in order for us to discover or sense a signal from another civilization. Everybody, this would change the world. What goes on at the SETI Institute will ch could very well, let's say reasonably, change the course of human history. And so as my mother would say, I'm proud to know you. So uh, tonight we are gonna honor Dr. Horowitz, Paul, with the presentation of nothing short of the Drake Awards. This is really uh, quite an honor for me, you all. And uh, Paul, I hope it gets to you as much as it gets to us. Congratulations, uh, virtually, I now, I guess, lean into the camera, really make eye contact with the viewer, and say, congratulations, Dr. Horowitz. You are hereby the 2021 recipient of the SETI Institute's Drake Award. <laughs> Look at that, as if by magic. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, science guy. Um, over to me. Well, you know, I was reading the New York Times the other day, and they talked about Bill Nye, the science guy, is doing TikToks these days. And, and someone, one of your fans, this, this thing keeps disappearing. I'll read you what it says. But there's, you can see a little bit of Bill Nye there and a little bit of yellowed out part here. And it says, this guy says, it was during this time when nobody knew what was happening. So they turned to people they trusted. And for us, that was Bill Nye. He said, I will do anything Bill Nye tells me to do. So, um, but I like <laughs> Well, Paul, thank you, but the award is for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so. Thank you. And so everybody out there, if you trust what Bill Nye, the science guy says, honor Paul Horowitz tonight. <laughs> so, so listen, in my nine minutes I get, it looks like eight now. Um, <clears throat> I just want to sort of touch on three themes, maybe three minutes each. Um, first of all, how my life got captured by SETI. Interesting story. And I think that various people on this call probably would like to have their lives captured by SETI. Some thought on uh, SETI's trajectory, you know, where it's gonna go, where it's been. And then it takes a village and you'll see what I mean by that when I get to that. So, so, you know, in life, they say, you don't get to choose your parents, but in academia, you do, because you can look for the folks who are doing interesting or wacky stuff and just cling to them. In fact, I remember coming as a freshman to Harvard and um, I just decided I wanted to meet this guy Bob Pound, who, uh, an NMR guy and, and so on. And um, I just popped in front of his office door and just waited until he showed up. So you can, you can choose your parents. Anyway, my parents, there goes two minutes. Um, my parents here are about four or five. It really started with Ed Purcell, who was a professor at Harvard, uh, actually a Nobel Prize winner for nuclear magnetic resonance. Um, his graduate student, Doc Ewan, discovered the 21 centimeter radiation from space. A good guy. And um, he gave a lecture. Let's see if I can find it here. He gave a talk at Brookhaven. Let's see if I can make this work. It was called Radio Astronomy and Communication Through Space. It was 1960. This was the time when Frank was doing OSMA. And um, he talked about, first of all, how radio astronomy had enabled, I'll find the quote here, had enabled um, radio astronomers to map out the, the arms of the galaxy through the Doppler shifts of this 21 centimeter line. And then he talks about how, how incredibly little energy it took. And he said, I'll just quote this here. A more astonishing figure is one I had to compute three times before I was sure of my arithmetic. The total energy received by all 21 centimeter observatories over the past nine years, this was in 1960, is less than one erg. From less than one erg, we have built this picture of our galaxy. And then I love this comic because it's so 1960. Most of you know what an erg is. You can't knock the ash off your cigarette with an erg. Of course, now you don't even have a cigarette. But I thought that was totally cool. Anyway, he talks about radio astronomy. Then he talks about um, how little energy. Then he talks about space travel and how incredibly much energy that takes. But then he loops around to SETI. And he says, SETI could take advantage of this incredible efficiency. And, um, and he said, you know, you don't have to go there. When you take your kid to the museum, you, you say, we don't touch the pictures. We step back and look at them. We learn through communication. So, and he has, by the way, a comment about Frank's Ozma research at the time. Um, 
Okay, so he was, he was the first of my parents. <laughs> and then Carl Sagan. So when I was a graduate student at Harvard, Carl was a junior faculty there teaching a course on life in the universe. He, uh, he was basically teaching the book that he and Shklovsky wrote. And that was wonderful. I wasn't taking it, but one of my roommates was. I sort of took it vicariously. It was great. Then comes Frank. Frank came and gave a series of Loeb lectures, which are wonderful you know, sponsored lectures. And um, it was about radio astronomy, but the last one was about SETI, you know, and it was just, just wonderful. I mean, just thought this is, this is so great. You know, it's not pure speculation. You can calculate things. You can realize what it takes. And Ed Purcell's talk, in fact, said an interstellar telegram costs a dollar per word. It really is efficient stuff. So when I had a sabbatical, I wrote a note to Frank. I guess I was probably sending a regular letter because we didn't have email, right, Frank? I said I was interested in looking for life in Puerto Rico. And Frank got the joke. He was head of the RCB Observatory at the time. He said, sure. And he said, do you need some money? And I thought, my God, I hadn't even thought of that. You get paid to do this? It's terrific. So anyway, I went down there and did this search with... Um, uh, actually, Frank caught me one day when he came down. I was in the library, hold up with books. I figured this is what you do. He says, get out of here. Go down to the control room and learn how to do SETI. So I did. That was great. And he did this really cool narrowband search um, whose sensitivity was really incredible. It was very narrow in frequency, but super deep in sensitivity. It, its threshold of sensitivity was such that if a millionth of a millionth of a watt was falling on the entire Earth's disk, we would have detected it with the dish at Arecibo a micro microwatt total earth. I mean, put that in your pipe and smoke it. Okay, so then um, uh, I published that paper in science and then I got a strange letter from a guy by the name of Charlie Seeger on his home stationery saying, what was this? And he started asking all these questions. Anyway, it's connected me up with, with Jill Tarter and Barney Oliver, two other greats in this field. And at that point I was hooked. Now let me do a really quickie quickie. Am I allowed to share screen? I hope so, okay. Um, because I see him out of time already. Share. All right. No, you're getting an award, Paul. Relax. <laughs> yeah. in. Launch, baby. Launch again. That's uh, yeah, cool. There we got it now. All right. So I'm just going to show you a couple of things. Sort of talking about timelines because um, you know astronomers are used to time, but non-astronomers sometimes aren't. You know, people people think that uh, many folks think we've been doing SETI just about forever. You know, since almost when they were born, and we haven't found anything. So you know. But let's talk about time. So um, I'm going to have to make this thing go forward. How about this one? This one. Ah! So um, this is one of the world's foremost scientists clicking <laughs> like crazy. OK, oh, here we go. we go. That's a great picture. Yeah, you should have watched us all try to connect with Zoom tonight. That was really hilarious. OK, so look, here's the way to think about time. Um, we we're 13.7 billion years ago, Big Bang. Um, solar system, planets, and everything, about one, one third the way back. We're kind of young. Um, let's call that a day. This is a nice way to think of time scales. So here, look, life arose at five in the morning, you know, not bad. The thing had to cool off. You had to have oceans. You had to stop the great bombardment. It was pretty simple life until, until just a few hours before midnight. Then it got interesting. Let's look at that last hour. Well, now we started to get multi, you know, interesting things. Um, dinosaurs were roaming the, the world until about here, about uh, 12 minutes, uh, 20 minutes before midnight. An asteroid sort of ruined their whole day. It made the Yucatan Basin and so on. But that allowed little tiny mammal things like us to have a chance. Let's look at the last minute. Um, I've sort of left things out here, but you sort of get the idea that here's Neanderthals um, two seconds before midnight. Um, and we sort of came from them, right? Let's take a look at the last second. Here it is. Now things are getting interesting. By the way, the scale is 50,000 years per second. So here we are. Agriculture is about 10,000 years old. That allowed us to devote more to brain and less to gut. And the discovery of fire also helped a lot. Recorded history about 5,000 years ago. That's a tenth of a second before midnight, you know? It hasn't always been the way it is. And let's take a look at the last tenth of a second. I gotta move this ugly thing out of the way on my screen. Um, now it gets interesting. So here's a tenth of a second before midnight. Here's Jesus, here's Columbus, here's the American Revolution. Here's Marconi, two milliseconds. Lasers, radio telescopes, about one millisecond. Um, why are we interested in lasers and radio telescopes? You know, aren't we more interested in Columbus? Um, well, because if we want to communicate with them electromagnetically, we're going to need those things. So that's the millisecond. And you know, good stuff's going to happen. Now, why does this thing keep, oh, it thinks I'm on that thing. All right. Um, let me just show you um, 
One more slide, just one more, I promise. Um, now I gotta move this guy out of the way. I wish I had more screens. Here's the last 500th of a second, the last two milliseconds. Um, and the scale here is people like Frank and Dan and myself and, and so on. Um, so here Frank was born just in time for Jansky to discover uh, radio waves in space. Uh, I was born just in time for Doc Ewan and Purcell to discover the 21 centimeter line, which is an important line for SETI folks like us. Um, there's Dan, he was born a little late for that, but in time for Ozma, here's Frank's Ozma, one channel. Now what I'm plotting here against <laughs> milliseconds are just the growth of number of simultaneous channels in, I'm um, running out of time. Is that what you're telling me? Ooh. No, no, I'm just I'm make, making a time joke. Oh, a oh, oh. You're, making, you're making a pun. Okay, yeah. Oh, okay. sorry, man. No, 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 okay. no. All right, right, anyway. Yeah, this is cool, man. But Share it with everybody. This there's, is a cool. single, there's a single metric. There's a lot more going on in SETI, but this is just the number of simultaneous radio channels that we're able to receive. Frank Ozma had one channel. Um, you know, there's other things like frequency coverage and, and how big is your antenna and all that. But let's just look at this one metric. So this is this thing that um, Frank sent me down and gave me $1,800 stipend. It was really great. It was a 65,000 channel analyzer. It was super, super sensitive, but it was a cheat. It was software. So I, I made, I faded it to pink. Here are the real uh, spectrometers that have been built to do uh, radio SETI. So here's, here's Dan's 100 channel hardware spectrometer. Um, here's the thing that the Planetary Society actually sponsored, which is called Suitcase SETI. And this was 130,000 channels. Yeah, actually that's that's actually meta, but we're getting there. Um, here's um, Dan now, we had 130,000 channels at Harvard. So Dan came in with 65,000. Actually 130 was just two pieces of 65,000. So I don't get any extra credit. But then we went ahead with 8.4 million channels with Steven Spielberg's money through the Planetary Society. Okay, back at Berkeley, they're catching up. Here's 4.2 million channels, right? But then we went to Beta. This was sponsored by uh, partly by NASA and partly by the Planetary Society. 270 million channels, quarter of a billion channels. That's a lot of channels. Okay, here, now they're starting to step on the gas at Berkeley. Dan puts 170 million channels. And then around this time, at, we at Harvard started switching to optical, but Dan didn't stop. He's got half a billion channels. Now he's got 5.6 billion channels, serendip two, three, four. 38 billion channels. This is now, and pretty. And this is the, for the fast telescope in China, and 34 billion channels. This is going to go in the Meerkat. I'm going to show you one more slide, and this slide is is for you, Adam. Okay. Um, Adam and I, Adam and I were at a a conference in in 2007, and I showed this slide. If I can figure out how to show this slide, but you have to click on to make this thing go. I showed this slide just to say there's a lot of stars out there. There are more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on all beaches of Earth. It's the back of the envelope calculation. By the way, the number now is, is there's actually another factor of 10 because we discovered there's not nearly 100 billion galaxies, there's a trillion galaxies. So, but about a 10th of them have habitable stars, have habitable planets. So the right answer now is there are more habitable planets in the universe than there are grains of sand on all beaches of Earth. If you don't think there's living things out there, you're crazy. Anyway, Adam said after the conference, I got to have that envelope. I'll send you something really great. So I mailed it to him. I gave him my return address. I ain't got nothing. So Adam, you owe me. Um, oh, maybe, maybe just a piece of a lead balloon or something. You know, you must, you must have some scraps. Okay, so um, I have to unshare. It's way up there now. And I have to finish. I have to finish. Um, um, well, I want to finish with the following, which is, I didn't do this thing by myself. I did it with lots of other people. It takes a village. The two people in the background here are Andrew Howard and Curtis Mead, who both got their PhDs um, with me in, in uh, SETI at Harvard. Um, the, um, but there are many other people. Uh, let me just name some names because they're probably listening and they'd love to hear their name or their, their girlfriends would love to hear their name or their boyfriends. Anyway, Chip Caldwell, Jason Galicchio, Andrew Howard, Darren Lay, Curtis Mead, and Jonathan Weintraub all got PhDs. Four of them got it in SETI. Wonderful undergraduates. There's some, you know, they got so much energy. They're so smart. Derek Bass, Greg Galperin, Steve Howard, Brian Matthews, Nick Sheckman, Pratheef Srithran, and Jonathan Wolf. Volunteers. These guys do things like 
help you build an observatory. They paint your observatory. John Forster, Mal Jones, Mike Williams, Al Slisky, and his sons, David and Aaron. Finally, colleagues and staff at the observatory are, are at Harvard, Joe Caruso, Dave Latham, Skip Schwartz, Robert Stefanik, and Joe Zajac. At Arecibo, Mike Davis, Bob Duquette, John Hagen. At Harvard, Winfield Hill, Jim MacArthur, Maggie McPhee, Caspa Paliolios, and Guyan Wee. And at the Stanford, Berkeley, UCSD, Princeton collaborations, Peter Backus, Kok Chen, Bill Daly, Ed Groth, Ivan Linscott, Tap Lum, he helped us build what we call Lumplifiers, Al Peterson, Cal Teague, Dan Wertheimer, um, Dave Wilkinson, Shelley Wright. And last is you can have all these people, but you can't make stuff if you don't have some dough. We, we, the, our original sponsor was the Planetary Society. You've heard about them from Bill Nye. Um, they sponsor Suitcase SETI, Sentinel, and Meta. And then um, NASA and, and Arecibo, um, the Beta Project, the Bozak and Kruger Charitable Foundation, they funded our students. They funded the first SETI PhD in the world, that was Darren Lay, and they funded the next four, which until 2017 was two thirds of all the PhDs in SETI in the world. We now have only half. Um, Steven Spielberg funded um, the Meta Project and Franklin Antonio has been funding our new all sky optical work that we're doing with those universities. The final parting shot is you can't count on the government for this kind of stuff. The government's not gonna fund things like SETI Forward. This has to be grassroots. It has to be private organizations, things like the SETI Institute, doing both doing SETI like the ATA and the laser SETI, but also sponsoring students and the Planetary Society and Breakthrough Listen. These are the engines that's make, making SETI great and we'll keep making it great until we find bastards in cloud. Thank you.